Hi, Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Aster, the community manager here at Finji, and I am so excited uh, to be here today with two incredible people um, and to chat all things Tunic. You all submitted a lot of questions. A whole you have a lot of questions. I wouldn't have I would have expected that, but I think it was more than I expected. <laughs> so we're gonna try to get through as many as we can. I think all three of us have our plushies, right? Yeah. <laughs> I dropped the shield. So. I don't know what I want. <laughs> uh so we're gonna try to get through as many as we can, but let's start um with introductions. Um, I think we should start with the fox himself. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I didn't put that there. Aster put that there. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Schuldice. I, um, I guess, like director, or primary developer on a video game called Tunic, which I hope you've all played because we're going to talk some spoilers. Yep. Um, I'm Eric Billingsley. I was the, the level artist. I came on a couple of years before launch and made the areas look nice and also sort of just general all around or whatever needed to get done on the game. Yeah, um, if we were doing yeah. a, an accurate subtitle, it would say level artist, shader, wrangler, uh, <laughs> fish, swim behavior designer, halftone shader writer, keyboard, PC keyboard support writer, a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Amazing. Well, welcome, uh, welcome, welcome, both of you. Um, it is so great to have you here. Um, while we chat today, we thought we would also play a little bit of uh, a game that we think you all might know. Um, so, what do you think? What do you think, Andrew? Should we should we start playing while we chat? Let's do it. Yeah, Let's I'm seeing it. some people talking about uh, audio sounding doubled for them. Uh, I don't know if that's that's did something change very recently we are going to play a little bit of the game and let me know if if are we mods are we hearing doubled audio just andrew oh just andrew oh, okay it's just echoing i don't know hmm. interesting interesting um, i can hear andrew fine it might be i think andrew it might just be it might just be your mic is a little different it, just echoing. Okay, maybe I'll it doesn't it sounds normal to me so there must okay, be something to turn down the game here. maybe a little bit check check one two I don't know if that's any better. I might just be a little bit quieter now, maybe less echoey. I think you sound good. You sound good to me. You sound good to me. Okay. Maybe Andrew is a robot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play a little bit of the game. We're gonna play a little bit of the game while we chat. Um, chat. Let us know if it sounds better. But um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it does. Do we need to start looking for a golden path pattern? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> no, no secrets in this. We're there, tired. It's a good <laughs> idea that you say that, that actually, because I could imagine people looking at this VOD and and just trying to see if there was like a reason that you went to specific places. <laughs> no, absolutely not. We're just we're normal human beings. Just I'm playing. Not, okay. Completely why, straightforward game. Yeah, that's why we fired it up because I haven't played this game in a very long time, and I've played it a lot less lately than I have uh, before. So I don't know, just, you know, figured we'd noodle around. <laughs> Perfect. I um, so I think we have to address as our first question. Um, and I think, I think I have some apologies to make for this one personally, but we have to address the elephant sized fox in the room. Uh, <laughs> many, many, many folks want to know if there's going to be a tunic um, and I and I apologize, chat, for putting tunic as the pun for promoting today's stream. But I had to. It's the second birthday. You got to do it. <laughs> yeah, it would be disappointing if you didn't. Yeah. Uh, um, any plans for a sequel? Uh, no, no. I'm I'm tired. <laughs> Um, we uh, we we come to you today as normal everyday human beings who um, want to chat to you about the thing that we worked on a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, no, no big plans for anything now. I feel like we used up all of our especially good ideas and are, I don't know, interested in working on new and different stuff. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but yeah, no, no big plans for Tunic 2. Or tu <laughs> tu 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 <laughs> tunic. Three. Yeah, we're skipping Tunic. Oh, I know you did Tunic. 
<laughs> when would it end? Three Nick, four Nick? It would never end. Never ending. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think chat, I think we are intentional about not having uh game audio, right? That, right, that was an intentional choice we we, we settled uh, on. Yeah. It, okay. Also, it's hard to get computers to deal with audio properly. Plus, yeah. you want to hear <laughs> our voices, right? That's most important. Um, but thank you yeah. for letting us know, Chad. It's it's good to it's very good to have people be like, this is a tech issue because it's hard to know if if something is going wrong. Um, yep. So we also got, I think, second to the tunic questions. Our most common question. Um, was about secrets, obviously. Um, people really, really, really want to know, have they found all the secrets? Um, a lot of people are asking for like specific percentages even. <laughs> per yeah, like I, I got a big old checklist. I mean, first of all, I haven't been keeping track. I don't know what you found. I know that a lot of the big stuff was cracked pretty early on. Um, but I don't know, philosophically, I feel like Think, think of think of think of what the answer would be if the answer is no right would you want to know like the whole joy of of exploring a world that feels like it goes on forever is that you don't know you don't know if there's another secret just around the corner and so i don't know there there are lots of other games out there that try to play in the same spaces and i think we'll talk a little bit about those as well later on um uh, i would check those games out um, and, uh, yeah, I think maybe, um, the, 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 the ethos of Tunic is making you feel like maybe there was something more, but maybe not. <laughs> so there you go. There's your second, uh, non-answer for the day. <laughs> I also have no idea what the answer to that question is. <laughs> um, we, we had, we had to get those out of the way, chat. Thank you. <laughs> Um, speaking of secrets, uh, Supreme Curb from the Finji Discord, thank you, Finji Discord, for all of your supreme questions, um, is curious, what was your process when stuffing the game full of secrets? Uh, did you have most of them planned out as you designed new gameplay areas and sequences, or did you add most of them retroactively? Um... I, it depends on the secret, really. So there are some secrets that were uh, designed to be grand sweeping things that, you know, we, we very meticulously planned out, like knowing how to uh, pray, for instance, like that. Um, again, spoilers. Um, that was something that was planned really, really closely, you know, knowing, making sure people didn't find it too early and knowing when we wanted them to find it. Um, that was something that was sort of planned, not from the beginning, because the game took seven years to make. And so it was sort of, it took a little while for the game to crystallize, really. But that was like part of the core plan. And then there's stuff like, oh, you need to count the number of candles around this platform. That was that was a blank for a long time. That was, and then there'll be a bunch of secrets related to this thing. And that mostly took the form of a bunch of lists like, oh, wouldn't this be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? And then when it actually came time to implementing them, going through that list and being like, what makes sense now? What is what is feasible? Uh, what is what would be fun? Um, so if you if anybody has any specific questions about specific uh, puzzles, then I can try and remember. Um, Eric, do you have any specific memories about stuff that we added maybe really early or really late? Um, I can't think of anything specifically. I know like for for certain things like uh it, it just some some things kind of come out as you're designing the level when you're like oh it'd be cool if something went here and then you try to think of what that should be or you lay out the level and you're like oh we could we could hide a little shortcut to get back here mm -hmm. um and that just kind of comes up and makes sense and then you try it out and it works um so i think it's a mix of things that are planned and then a lot of the smaller things just uh you you, you deal with those as as you have the idea for them yeah, I feel like like some of the there was there were a couple of waterfalls late where we're like, oh no, there's a waterfall without something hidden behind it. Uh, uh, have it be a, a, a useless path that goes from one side of the overworld to the other. That'll that'll confuse people. It'd be interesting and cool. Yeah, yeah, I do remember some of those being added really late. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I could imagine that some of those, especially those kinds of secrets, um, you would need to like 
see the level and be working in it to be like, oh, yeah, I should put that there. <laughs> and yeah, I think that absolutely. comes across. Yeah, we'll probably talk about iteration as well. Like so many of these levels were constructed and reconstructed so many times um, and secrets like a, a path going from this point to that point. Sometimes levels were redesigned because it's like, ah, oh, we really want people to be able to take a secret path from here to here, but the level geometry just doesn't allow for it. Tear it all up, fold yeah. it back on itself, like rebuild the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we do actually have some questions later in today's conversation about some specific puzzles. Um, so this is a really good time for me to say, um, and I probably should have said this all earlier. Um, if you haven't finished the game, you, this, maybe you want to watch this in the future when we post it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause we are going to get into some spoiler territory today. Um, Probably that's obvious, but just in case, <laughs> if there's anybody sitting here who hasn't finished the game, it's one you want to experience for yourself uh, unspoiled. So um, we'll we'll be here when you finish. We'll post this on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Pause now. Pause now. <laughs> okay, now you're back. How's the future? Is it weird? <laughs> yeah, please. I hope it's I hope it's nice in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I have another question. Um, this one is a little bit less about secrets, but is still about, um, something cool. Um, Poppy wonders from the Finji discord wonders how on earth, all caps, were you able to construct such an amazing language for this game? It's such an interesting language with really simple, but fun to learn rules. And I cannot imagine how it could have come about or how long it must have taken. Uh, so that was that was quite early. Surprisingly, it, it, it took me looking back on a lot of this stuff to realize how early it was. But before the manual was like even really decided on, is like, oh, this game should have a manual and it'll collect the pages and it'll have secrets and stuff. Um, the language was was designed, um, and it was. I mean, the game is about sort of feeling like you're in a place where you don't belong. You know. Um, you're a stranger in a strange land. And the very earliest notes working on the game said things like, oh, you find a letter and it's written in a language you don't understand. And having that extend to the game itself, like the UI and things like that, seemed like a, a natural progression. And so it was it was pretty early that it it um it came about. And the Fez is a pretty strong inspiration for this game. And it has, uh, spoilers for Fez, it's got a secret language in it, but it uses a pretty straightforward way of decoding it. Like the, the real trick is realizing that these strange glyphs in Fez mean something. And then it's a, it's a pretty straightforward exercise to figure out how to translate it. And, and we live in a post-Fez world. We did uh, in you know 2015 when I started working on this game. Um, so it couldn't be just that it couldn't be as simple as hey let's do this this basic cipher um it needed to be the sort of thing that you would look at and be like oh i can figure this out oh wait no this is just complicated enough that i need to spend some real time and i need a big corpus of data in order to figure it out um and, and the plan was that you were never really were supposed to like who who in their right mind would try to <laughs> take this thing and figure it out um so it was meant to be sort of an easter egg that, that the text actually meant something. Uh, and so it, yeah, it was tuned to be just obscure enough. And I've got actually over here, uh, attached to the wall, a, a, a framed, I, I, because I'm a narcissist, um, <laughs> I, I framed the original, the original like graph paper that I used to, um, uh, to, to, mark out like this was the key that i had on my wall not framed at the time it was just pinned to my corkboard <laughs> um the, uh, the, the, the 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 reference for the symbols meant um and uh yeah it's uh yeah someone in the chat um uh Sol -Sol says it's a memento which yeah I, I i you know thought that that would be sort of a nice uh, artifact to keep close at hand. And I've used it actually when I'm spell checking stuff for whatever reason, I'll lean over and be like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that, I think even though it was designed really early, um, the, the, all of the language in the game was being proofread, like right up until the re release. And I remember Kevin, Kevin Regamine 
became the, the really like the language ex expert and was going through all of the all of the language in the game and be like, oh, you used your your uh, your East Coast oat. For the <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we uh, needed to catch a few of those um, <laughs> endings as well, like uh, saying that something. I can't think of an example, but um, like sometimes vowels are very, very close together. And you're like, is this an ah sound or an e eh sound? It could be either way. And so we find ourselves, you know, like sp speaking uh, to ourselves at our desks, trying to figure out what, what phoneme is being pronounced. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming that means you were pretty surprised by how much of the community has learned the language and can train like I've watched community YouTube videos where people read out like all of the text as they're playing the game. Um, was that a surprise to you? That Sorry, this is an off script question. That, that they can read it out like naturally without taking a pause to check the reference document or whatever. Uh, that's that's pretty amazing. I haven't seen yeah, that. that. That's, that's pretty wild, yeah. That's cool. I've seen people who've gotten good enough to, like, I, I feel like if I've been paying attention, I can, like, sound it out a little bit and uh, and do pretty, you know, like, you'll, you'll go through and you do the first few phonemes and you're like, oh, okay, I can figure out what this is supposed to say. Um, but I, yeah, that's, that's amazing. I wonder if Kevin could probably do that at some point. Uh, <laughs> it's just, like, blow through it, read it. Because he, he proofread the entire manual front to back, yeah. like, a couple of times, I think. Sorry is spelled Canadian in the manual. Americans say sar sorry, 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 sorry. Um, there are the the super the, the super double secret Canadians hidden in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Couple of Canadian uh, Gotta features. Have it. Very yeah. important. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Many fans, uh, this was a very great many, want to know about your inspirations for the game, um, other than, of course, Zelda. Um, and this doesn't have to just be games, but it could also be um, other forms of media. Um, what what helped bring Tunic to us? Uh, I mean, people, they usually are like, you made a Dark Souls. Um, <laughs> and that's that is not incorrect. Like particularly Bloodborne, I think that combat in that is really, really good. The feeling of like someone's going to attack you, but you dodged it just the right time, and now oh no, you're attacking them. Like that that feeling is just really, really nice, and that was something that I was thinking about a lot when, when working on the game. Um, I I'm I'm embarrassed to say that I feel like the inspirations, at least on on my end, are very. Um, I don't know, wrote basic, uh, you know, it's like, you got your Zeldas, you got your Dark Souls, you've got your, um, your, your Ghibli movies. I know that that's such a, um, uh, uh, a trite thing to say, but that, you know, feeling of wonder and exploring an ancient civilization is just, I, mm, I love that so much. Um, Eric, what, what, what were you thinking about while you were, um, polishing and, and beautifying? Uh, uh, I think like visually Monument Valley was, was, a uh, pretty big influence as well. Yeah. Um, just kind of like the soft gradients with hard angles and and uh, mostly solid colors and that kind of thing. And uh, when I was doing some of the some things like the water effects, uh, I remember seeing a talk about the water in the game Rhyme, and that was mm -hmm. really beautiful. And there's a lot of cool stuff in that game visually. So that was probably an influence as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, I just watched you chop all that grass, uh, Andrew, and I got to say, I think that's my favorite thing to do in the game. <laughs> chop down grass? Chop down the grass. It's just it's something so satisfying. simple, but it's just so fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> Broomy, also from the Discord, uh, wants to know, have you played any other information lock puzzle games that function like Tunic does? Um, specifically mentioned Outer Wilds, La Mulana, um, and if so, do you have a favorite? You want to feel the this eyebrow Eric? raise? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we already talked about Fez a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me, there's two games that sort of that that stood out to me, which is uh, I think The Witness is has a really cool moment like that where you 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 sort of realize um, that you could do something all along that you didn't know you could, and it kind of changes the game. Um, I think my favorite game that does this and that like 
did it repeatedly to me when I was playing was uh, Steven's Sausage Roll mm. for anyone who's played that. But um, there's there's a few points in that game where you realize that there's a mechanic that's always been there and, and you're just like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh is, no! It's a lot more complicated. Yeah, I need and to go back. It's like, and it's also—it's not just that like you could do it all along. It's that you could have done it if the levels weren't extremely meticulously designed to just prevent you from doing it. Hmm. Um, and sometimes it's like you'll stumble upon it something by accident that completely blows your mind. And sometimes you'll get stuck on a level for thirty minutes and then have a sudden realization of like, oh my god, did, did they really want me to do that? Um, <laughs> And it's like the like the developer is just like like winking at you or something. I don't know. I, re I really enjoy that. Yeah, that Stephen Sausage role especially is is like that from a design perspective. It's doing this thing on absolute hard mode because it's not like oh, there's a secret button that you can press and it does something yeah. that we just tried to hide from you. Um, it's like no, no, you just we didn't give you. We understood your brain so well that we didn't give you an opportunity to think about it in this particular way. Yeah. Which is like there's an emergent property of all of this that you could have seen, but you didn't. Yeah. Uh, it's just <laughs> exquisitely done. And um, I guess I guess the difference between those games and Tunic is that those are already puzzle games. So you're kind of already or whereas mm -hmm. Tunic like it has secrets, but it, it sort of becomes more of a puzzle game the more you play it. And, mm, yeah. I, and it's maybe when you, you're coming in, you're thinking of it more as a, an action adventure. Um, someone else mentioned Rain World, which uh, has less of the puzzle, but there's things about the world. That's one of my favorite games of all time. And also, I just love Rain World, so I wanted to mention that. But uh, yeah. Uh, I want to I wanna play Rain World. For, for some reason, that came up recently. I'm like, oh, man, Rain World is one of those games that I feel like I I, I need to put time into and like understand. Because I don't think I've ever actually had any like, hands on with it. I heard people say, like, oh, it's really hard, but it seems like one of those like beautiful artifacts that, that yeah. is one of those like player ambivalent worlds. Yeah. So um, I haven't finished it. I have gotten to like level 140 or something when the puzzle started to get hard. But um, Void Stranger, I suspect, I suspect oh, yeah. is one of those games that's like, ah, there was more to this than you suspected. Yeah, I need to play that. Um, and yeah, that comment also just reminded me that I need to go back and actually play Outer Wilds because I'm ashamed to say I didn't get very far in it. And I don't think I've gotten to the point where where I would be seeing all these things. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Outer Wilds was the game that I saved for myself. I was like, I cannot play this. I will just become sad if I play this before the game is out. And so uh, I played it, I think, about this time last year-ish. And um, yeah, that game's, that game's awesome. You, you play Outer Wilds, I'll play Rain World. Okay. <laughs> and then we can all meet back here and discuss. <laughs> yes, on the third anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, three Nick we can have a nice long discussion about our experience with those games. <laughs> um, how's that sound chat? Are we, are we down? Is it a date? <laughs> I'm, I'm it. Uh, Ori asks, uh, Oh, hi Ori, by the way, it's been a while. Um, the, uh, I have not played the DLC. I would like to, um, I'm excited. I, I also haven't played the DLC. I've been saving it. I, I don't know for what a rainy day. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah I, I also haven't played Void Stranger, but I have been playing through Zero Ranger lately, and it makes me very excited to see what that team would do with the puzzle game. So I should I should play it. Yeah, I've seen a lot of folks actually um, in the Finji Discord talking about Void Stranger lately. Um, it seems like it's it's a popular one that folks are talking about right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Cassidy Bro uh, Cassidy Books, not Brooks, sorry, from the Finji Discord is curious about how you managed to make Tunic feel so nostalgic in its game design um, and why. It's a complex one. Um, nostalgia is, okay, so we, do we wanna get, I, I'm talking way out of my depth here because <laughs> it's my partner who knows like ancient Greek stuff and I'm just reiterating what they've told me, but, um, nostalgia the word is like literally is the pain of coming home i think that's what it's supposed to, to translate to or something like that and i think that that's a really eye-opening way of looking at nostalgia nostalgia is not oh man i love the past it is revisiting your past and suddenly having an ache for it not existing anymore right you can't um you can't 
swim in the same river twice sort of thing you know it has changed very inherently and so the approach with tunic was um trying to evoke the same feelings not the same content if that makes sense um and so when we play a game when we think about playing a game like zelda one it's not i i it, it's it's pixels that make me feel this way oh the pixels didn't make you feel that way in the past what made you feel that way was exploring something you didn't understand and having something um that feels like it was larger than it ought to be that it could go on forever um and that was what we were shooting for and that's a that's an impossible thing to do right so it's it you know the the fact that people were able to uh get a, a, a little bit of that feeling when they played uh like the person that asked this this question um cassidy uh is is really wonderful like that means that we succeeded that that we were able to to try and like make that same feeling happen by presenting a world that made you feel the same way that you did back then without necessarily being the like it's aligned to a grid and, and stuff like that um and hopefully that that answers the question <laughs> Um, what about you, Eric? Was um, was that at, um, at, in your mind at all when you were working on Tunic? Um, yeah, I think so. Because uh, just um, like sort of uh, the isometric view in general is is kind of a retro thing, and and just the way we could kind of hide passages and that kind of thing is is something that was. You know, in a lot of those older games that I remember from my childhood, um, I think it's really interesting to think about it. Like we're trying to create, like Andrew was saying, those same feelings, but with in someone who has the context of modern video games. And then aside from that, there's like the more obvious nods to like the manual and that kind of thing. That is, like games don't really have manuals anymore. So um, that's that was all Andrew, but it's like bringing bringing back that you need to look at the manual that we can integrate that into a game in a way that those games didn't right yeah the manual is uh definitely one of my favorite parts <laughs> i have it all over my office at this point many different versions <laughs> um amazing uh let me see where am i here um in my list of questions um full metal tamer is curious about things that were cut from the game um, is there anything in particular that was cut that you want to share about um, or or talk a little bit about? Huh. Um, that's a tricky one because if it's like, yeah, we we cut super cool thing X, um, <laughs> people will be sad that they they don't get it. Um, there there were a few things that were like in retrospect bad ideas that didn't make it into the game for a reason. Um, uh, thanks, Rad. Hi, Rad. My show up <laughs> moment there. I needed to calibrate my parries a little bit on that <laughs> on that guy beforehand, uh, but I'm glad you noticed. Um, so, like, I don't know the the fast travel system. It used to be. I think that. I mean, maybe I'm giving away ideas that I think would be cool in a game, but whatever. Somebody else can make this game, and I can play it. Be <laughs> delighted. But the the these these things here, um, the purple sort of traces on the ground, that used to be. I mean, it sort of still is the fast travel system in a certain way, um, but that used to be a thing where you would go into a special type of teleporter pad, or I think they're the things that became the teleporter pads later. You would go into it, and you would sort of like, you know, turn into a gas. You would you would uh, uh, transform into pure energy, and you would move along those traces in the world. And I think that was neat because it would be like, oh, by lowering fuses, I can like unlock fast travel paths and maybe I can only get to another place by going through one of these conduits. Um, and that was neat, but it was really fussy to control, like going around corners and stuff. And it was, um, it, it, it felt bad. And also anytime you were going, you like it's a fast travel system, you're going fast, but you would travel through uh scenes and they needed to load and even on fast development computers it was like this is a drag to be going super fast through a level but then needing to like load the next one and then zip and then load the next one it was just a little bit of a it, it was one of those things where it's like you know what if i think about cutting this and putting in something that is like 
maybe not quite as clever, but better in every way. You can just feel a weight lifting off your shoulders. You're like, okay, this is the right decision. This is the right decision. I love that. Clever, uh, not as clever, but better in every way. <laughs> yeah. I think That's I need a, that on my wall, to be honest. It's it's a it's a real trap to fall into. Is like I I want to be the cleverest boy, so I'm going to do the cleverest <laughs> thing, and then realizing like no, that's the the true cleverest boy would do the right thing, not the thing that makes you feel smart. That's really interesting. Yeah, um, I, I also I remember there was one area that we were talking about for a while that was supposed to be in the game and ended up getting cut, but it didn't really serve a purpose. Um, yeah, it yeah. was just like, and it was never very fleshed out, so. Um, yeah. I think it was the right call to remove it and, and then just replace it with basically like a single transition screen and because um, a lot of the other areas that were already in the game had more unique things about them and um, were yeah. more interesting. Um, and the, although I remember when I first got brought on, like uh, to see if I'd be a good fit for the team, that was the area that I kind of like took a section and worked on and I'm yeah. like, okay, now we're, we're going to now that'll also be the last thing we work on and maybe I can see how much my skills have changed, but I didn't get to do that. So, <laughs> um, yeah. the, the, the other one I remember is I remember you showing me a really early version of the, uh, the ruined atoll where, mm -hmm. um, the whole thing was, instead of being a square, it was kind of the same idea, but it was circular and the camera rotated around as you moved, yeah. which was yeah. clever, but also didn't really feel good. And, didn't add anything but um yeah that's another example interesting, of like yeah, yeah it was clever but not not actually good it was yeah. uh yeah you, instead of um <clears throat> like powering the teleporter and going oh here it is right here that's convenient um instead of <laughs> powering up the four things and going to the 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 teleporter in the middle and going up um the camera was in the middle there i'm pointing at the screen but you can't that makes no <laughs> sense we can um, imagine yeah um uh, it was in the, the middle of the, the cameras in the middle of the screen and yeah, it panned around as you explored the outside edge and it was neat, but it was, uh, confusing. And suddenly now the like, oh, this nice sort of like isometric perspective is like constantly being, uh, violated. I mean, it's still, it's still like orthographic, but it, it didn't look quite as good. Anyway, yeah, it was one of those things where it's, this is just, it's too fussy. It's too yeah, fussy. Yeah. Uh, but the cool thing there was that w when you when you did it, you oh man, yeah, this is actually ties into the um, the the conduit fast travel system was <laughs> you you needed to power all of the fuses because what you needed to do was go into fast travel mode, like turn into energy, and go around it fast enough that you would like enable some sort of mystic gyro, and then I didn't even know about that. I yeah, I, I, I totally <laughs> forgot about this. Um, and then the, the the library, which was underwater for some reason, would like <laughs> and burst up out of the ocean and like have water cascading off of it and stuff like that. And so when I was like, oh, this, what a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, just yes. Yeah, so, but you know what's you know what's cooler than a soggy castle is a castle in the sky. So mm -hmm. do that, and it'll be awesome. And then Eric, actually, we used it as a promo shot a lot of the time because I think it's one of the better screenshots in the game. But I think Eric, you worked on the exterior of that library a lot. Like you took all the yeah, yeah. Lego pieces and and put it on there. Um, it's really um, good. People are asking if I if I drew the maps. I did not draw the maps. Andrew drew the maps. <laughs> um, I traced the maps. The maps are um, screenshots of the game. Yeah, from a, a certain camera. And then I, I remember the position of that camera so that at runtime, that position could be like, okay, I know where to position the, 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 the you are here graphic on this thing by looking to where that camera would have been and doing a bunch of math to figure out where to blit this onto the, onto the thing. But uh, making the maps was one of the most fun things. It's very like therapeutic and sort of like, it's not, it's not hard. You're just tracing something with a nice brush in Photoshop or whatever. Um, and you know like adding little details and deciding what's relevant and what's not and when you can add little hints for puzzles and stuff it was it was a good time that's um, awesome to hear i've no, i don't think i've ever heard that that was the process <laughs> it was it was, uh, it was a lot of fun um this bird uh was drawn by my partner um and uh, my understanding is that this bird has caused a lot of people a lot of pain because it looks like it's a hint to a clue that's like oh, i love the bird it's got something this puzzle's got something to do with the bird um, no this is just me like hey do you want to do you want to draw a thing to put in the to put in the game um yeah 
Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we now we know. <laughs> also, I don't know. I'm still stuck on the soggy castle. Um, yeah. I, I, I can visualize it. <laughs> Was it um, was it difficult to come to those decisions to cut things, or did you get to the point where you're like, oh yeah, this has got to go? Um, I think it, it's oh how um, it, it starts out as hard, um, and so you don't do it, uh, and it gets harder and harder and harder to push forward with a particular idea until it just becomes like we we have run out of time. This is a too complicated an idea and the alternative is so much better and easier in all ways that's when it suddenly becomes easy right yeah, up until that point you're like no the, the relief the, yeah. yeah the um like the the dark woods for instance was just the area that eric was referring to earlier uh was just like a second forest with maybe some different monsters and it was yeah, foggy it's, this time it's, it's foggy and swampy and aside from that it wasn't that distinct so yeah yeah <laughs> uh, and so we were just like you know what it's it's we can't get rid of it we've put so much time into it that would be ludicrous um and then suddenly it's like no it's not ludicrous it is in fact an excellent idea let's move on with our lives <laughs> that makes a lot of sense um the next question is about what remained um so ginger from the fingy youtube actually um is curious what is your favorite piece of visual storytelling in tunic what do you think, Eric? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's we got a difficult the, the call. Chin scratch. <laughs> I, I think for me, it's uh, it's when you go, it's the scene down under the cigarette in the sort of lab area. Um, I think I think that's my favorite, but I don't know. There's a, it's hard to it's hard to narrow it down. How about you? Uh, I think that that's yeah, that's probably the most like bang for buck. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> like things getting entombed and then seeing the 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 endless sea of, of uh, black obelisks. I, uh, just for something different than I like the, um, the, the cathedral interior. Um, oh yeah, it just, if people are joining late, uh, my voice is a little robot -y. I don't know why exactly it's doubled up, but maybe it's because I'm streaming also. I'm not really sure. Hey, Computers I are hard. I'm muted on everything other than your mic. So I, yeah, I think it I might know. be your mic today, but. <laughs> okay, that's so weird, okay. Um, yeah, and I, I'm I'm in there with a second stream that's also muted, so I don't know. It's cool. It's two voices for the present one. Um, the, it's, the, uh, it's the fox himself effect. <laughs> yeah. The um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, the the cathedral was like I cathedral was one of the first places that was designed. Like it was one of the first dungeons that was designed that ended up being in the game in some form or another. You know, there were like. Uh, test dungeons that didn't make it into the game, but the, the the cathedral more or less made it in. It was totally rebuilt, but the same like geography um, was approximately the same. And I, at a certain point, it was like, oh no, I've made a terrible mistake. This is like the last place you go. It's like always been like, oh, I haven't gone to the swamp yet. And was, what's this cathedral I hear about? Um, and I'm like, you've been to a castle in the sky, you've fought a wizard, you've gone to the bowels of the earth and found ancient technology, and uh, you've been to a spirit realm, a, a, a church, you know, a, a building is, how could that possibly up the ante at all? And so it was this, you're like, what, what is, what is a, a, a relevant piece of storytelling that can happen there? And I think starting to see the truth about what has happened and like, um, you know, abuse of power and what the fate of some of the other people that maybe tried to come to this world were. I think that was like sort of a cool revelation, maybe not revelation, but like um, piece of the puzzle, I guess is how you'd say that. So I think that's a, that's another one, but yeah, Eric, I think you're right. That's a, the, the whole like ziggurat, lower ziggurat section is probably the most um, poignant. Awesome. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm still giggling that somebody in chat thought we did that to your voice for lore reasons. For lore. <laughs> we should have just gone with that. <laughs> it's for lore reasons. Sorry. <laughs> um, this next question is actually from me. Um, and it's, it's a really important one. Um, so I stuck it in there. Um, do either of you have any nicknames for the Fox? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, pl player character .cs. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, um, well, just a little guy, a little guy. 
um, <laughs> genderless guy. Um, I don't not 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 really. Eric, what about you? I I don't I don't think I really do. Um, is it the the original like the this the super old version of the fox? I think it was it Dorito Fox. Dorito, yeah, I think that was more tricky. I like that. that. Yeah, just like because it was extremely low poly, looked like a like a Dorito, just all angles and triangles and, and bright orange. Yeah. Um, I like that. So this is non Dorito Fox. <laughs> Um, chat, this is officially your invitation to put your nicknames for the fox in chat if you want to. Uh, keep keep them rule appropriate, but <laughs> um, we'd love to see them if you want to share. <laughs> um, Eerie Daniela from our Instagram wants to hear about the creative process behind the level design for Tunic. Um, I guess we can sort of go in order, uh, you know, starting with how it's conceived and then, you know, uh, Eric, like polishing and decoration and stuff. Um, uh, Scipio says Tunk. Yes, Tunk. Uh, <laughs> tunk is the name of the box. Uh, the, um, as an aside, that was the name of the, the Jira, like bug tracking code for the game internally at Vinji. You know, because apparently they're only four letters long, so someone named it Tunk. And so more often than not, Tunic is referred to as Tunk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so creative process-wise, like, usually it starts with a vibe or like a reason for an area to exist. Like, um, oh, here's the, you know, the, the, the hollowed out quarry where they were like looking for treasures, or here's um, this uh, ancient um, ruined atoll that's been co-opted by this these these frog people or whatever um like normally like a general vibe is where it starts and then um it, it, usually like requirements like you come in and you leave from certain places like it usually connects to the rest of the world in a particular way and so making sure that you exit at more or less where you're supposed to come in makes sense and then figuring out like oh where should the boss be and do we want to make sure that you see something first so there needs to be a path that goes past or like looks over a section um like all those sorts of things get compiled into like a big list of like requirements um, and set pieces and things like that and then uh like sketches on a whiteboard or on graph paper or um uh, isometric graph paper was something that i used a fair bit later on especially which I couldn't actually find anywhere. Like it's quite hard to find isometric dot grid stuff. So I ended up printing out a bunch of stuff um, and sort of sketching and resketching and uh, eventually taking that and gray boxing it out into something that is just, well, I mean, a bunch of gray boxes. You, you've probably seen game development videos where people take, uh, they're like, here's what it looked like in the end. But before it was just this and it's just, stark no detail whatsoever a hallway is just like a tube um and that's what i would hand to uh often to i would hand that to eric and what i would do is i would take a small section of it and i would say i'm gonna make this look the way i want it to look so i set up the the like um the materials and the the textures and build all the props and like arches and bits of moss and trees and or bits of uh railings and things like that and i'll take one little section little bite-sized piece and decorate the heck out of it and then i'd say eric what do you think and we'd go back and forth and figure out a good look and then say and then eric would like i, I was gonna say like flood fill that aesthetic over the whole grade box but it, i mean it takes more more uh, <laughs> finesse than that for sure yeah and i think yeah. it, it varies some of the areas had more of a defined look when you passed them off to me and some of them didn't um so it kind of varied a little bit who was sort of trying to decide what the what the uh like what the architecture would be in this area or that kind of thing some of the finer details um, but but usually like at least the theme of the area and like the general look was already established yeah and there were a few areas where i think we like handed it back and forth quite a bit where we would say you know like i did grid box yeah. you did decoration i would touch it up send it back to you and then you would improve it further and um, yeah. yeah, it was a good good collaboration. And there, there's definitely a few, even after I came on, where um, the the area got basically completely redesigned. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most common thing I saw happen was that like we would have this big sprawling area, and then version two would you would just kind of we would like play through it and be like these are the things that are interesting, but it just feels like there's a lot of empty space. 
-hmm. And then so we take those things that are interesting and kind of compress compress the level down and make it a bit boxier. And so things kind of lock together. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a, like you would think that a smaller level would be less fun, but it, it ends up being a lot more fun and feel a little bit more uh, sort of everything in it. It feels more meaningful. Um, yeah, it's more and intense. You're, there's less just like walking around to get to the next thing. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. that that's that same uh, um, atoll area that we were talking about before. That that went through a few revisions, and a lot of them were enormous. Like I look back at screenshots, and I was like, "Here's this one," and like one corner of the world like one platform that would end up being the things where it has the fuse on it was like screen size like it was a football field yeah. it's like wow it's like it's just it's, it wasn't fun like yeah you're you're right like just yeah. the boxing. frog cave is, is the other one i remember mm -hmm. going from being a lot bigger to being smaller and just like more interesting and then the other thing uh i think i think pretty much at the end of the or near the end of designing that level um like the, the exit, we used to have to exit out of there the same way you came in. And then I was like, hey, wait, what if you, what if there's a back way to get out? And that was one of those things that I added in there and it, it kind of, so the, the level got smaller and then it got a little bit bigger again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was really a, a fun thing as well. That and the, um, uh, the hot tub in the front cave <laughs> was a thing that was delightful to me because that was not in the gray box. That was one of those additions. Um, like the the exit, we I, I feel like we we talked about um, and did, but the the uh, the hot tub okay. was a surprise. Like I remember playing that for the first time and being like, "Well, there's secrets in this game. Like there's a <laughs> there's a there's a cool thing that I didn't know about because you had added it yourself." Oh, yeah, I guess there's, there's sort of two hot tubs in, in that area. Uh, oh yeah, no, the secret, secret hot tub. Because yeah, I think yeah. the one when you first come down, that used to be a statue or something. And I was like, yeah, uh, yeah. what could be different about this area? And like, why are these guys just standing here? What if they're, what if they're just taking a load off in, in a hot tub? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, and, and yeah, so generally, but generally once I got a level, like the, the, sometimes they would be visually distinct already, but like the, the big things I would be thinking about are uh, like color palette and like, how can we, grade the color differently or have the lighting look different to make it feel different from the other areas. Um, sometimes it would be, uh, maybe the water should be a different color. I, I think the atoll for a long time um, had this basically the same water as in the overworld. And it wasn't until pretty late that I was like, this feels not distinct enough. And then just giving it that lighter water color that like fades to the white mm, instead yeah. of fading to dark completely changed the way that area felt and made it more like beachy and tropical. Um, um, so usually I, I, I'd be handed the gray box area and it would just be sort of a, after, after the general look has been established, maybe it's like, oh, we need some special architectural thing for here and this is what, what the style should be. Um, and then it would just be kind of going through each section of the level and taking the boxy stuff and taking chunks out of it or moving stuff around a little, um, adding in um, the, the 3D models to make it look more detailed. It, it's it's kind of a, a difficult, the art style for the game, it, it took a while to sort of nail down how much detail we wanted because it's supposed to be very stylized and it's almost verging on looking unfinished, but you want to have detail, like the just the right amount of detail, but not too much. Um, and it took a while to nail that down, um, but eventually you get a feel for it and then kind of try to keep a consistent level of detail across the game. Um, and then, yeah, just, just going through making all those changes and, and laying down lots of little tufts of grass everywhere and little <laughs> plants and details and um, adding kind of effects and things where they're needed and that kind of thing. Uh, that was uh, uh, at a certain point um, I, was, I was told maybe by, by Adam or Felix maybe um, that I wasn't allowed to add tufts of grass anymore. Um, that was when we were like, no, you, in order to finish this game, you need to keep building areas and gray box them and not polish up areas that uh, already exist. And that was the point is like, we we needed, we didn't know it at the time, but we needed an Eric. Uh, and so I was forbidden from adding tufts of grass because it would be a, a, a poor use of time. I, for uh, one, am very grateful for the grass everywhere. I'll just go ahead and say that. <laughs> yeah, good job, Eric. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the other thing I remember really changing the feel of the atoll specifically was just like transplanting the fish I had already made for the West Garden there because mm. um, 
they're the same fish, but because the water is different and they're colored based on the water, now they kind of glint with light when they come to the surface, and that looks really cool. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, uh, Rad Ringtail asks if it was uh, painful to reduce the size of some of the areas because making them big was fun. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, surprisingly, no. Like I think once it was small, it was like, ah, oh, no, this is much better. This is much nicer and more dense. And I guess the places where it is important that something be big now had that gravitas. Yeah, yeah. And it's, 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 I think it's especially important in a game where you have a fixed camera like that, because if it's too big, then you just get lost because um, you can't see all around you, right? You can only see what's immediately near you. Is there a guy in here? I forget if there's a guy in here. There used to be. <laughs> it's a new game plus thing. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm sure distracted by the video <laughs> games. <laughs> This is a oh no, that, was, that was silly. Um, <laughs> this is a room that had um, that used to be. That's something that got cut. There used to be, you know, the 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 giant guys that have big bone hammers that smash and swing it around. There there was one in here. Like that that guy was made to be in this zone. Like oh, this is a little dungeon that I should have a boss at the end. Um, and it was just it was not fun. It was not fun. And so uh, just a, a sort of uh, implicit turret trap is what ended up being here <laughs> that's really cool to hear actually um i think i'm glad i think i'm glad that he's not there <laughs> yeah that might just yeah. be me though <laughs> that, uh... um this is sort of related to some of the things that you were talking about but ns games 24 on youtube asked um despite all the work and all the tufts of grass i added that in uh what motivated you to finish the game um what helped, what helped you get there? Uh, sunk cost fallacy, I guess, mostly. <laughs> um, no, but it, it, the, the idea that, um, so yeah, ma making games for me has always been a thing that's like, I've got this really neat idea and I'm going to work on it and be really excited. And then like most things, you get distracted and you think I've got a new thing to be interested in or the thing that I was working on got hard and so i stopped working on it <laughs> um and that is that that is still somewhat true and I, it was going to be true for this game so uh i i knew like oh game jams are really good let's let's maybe if i have a game jam mentality where it's just you got to finish this you've got a, a fixed amount of time and that's it um well that didn't end up working um because the game took a long time to make but the 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 constraint instead of you only have so much time was you only have so much um well but you only have so much time insofar as you only have a certain amount of budget uh but also bringing on other people so um the development was a lot moodlier and squirrelier and more experimental early on and then suddenly when other people are looking at what you're making and you're collaborating with them it becomes a lot uh it becomes a lot harder to abandon a project, do you know what I mean? Um, or not even, it, just thinking smaller, abandon a an area or a feature that you're working on. You need to talk to people and say like, hey, I'm starting to think that this is a, a bad idea. Should we trash this particular um, aspect of the game? And you, know, you can hash it out and figure out what's a good idea and what's not, but you can't trash the entire thing. Um, <laughs> And practically speaking, for working on projects, I think uh, not burning yourself out is important. So keeping track of how much time you're spending on something and realizing that if you've been staring at a problem for hours and hours and hours, it's time to go for a walk. I think that's a good thing to do. Um, leaving your, If you're having a really, really good time with something, like yeah, if you're having a bad time with something, it's probably time to take a break, come back to it with fresh ideas or fresh eyes. If you're having a fabulous time with something, still take a break you will be excited to come back to it yeah. and you will probably be sharper than you think you are so yeah don't don't um sacrifice yourself on the altar of a, a video game um, yeah it takes the time you need i i know like when you're working on a, a big project for a really long time there is you feel sort of a weight like you're like there's so much has gone into this and i really want to get it out to people and that itself can be motivating but you still need to be careful with that um and i remember for this particular project i don't know why but even compared to other things i've worked on 
it really there was it was a really quick transition between like me feeling like how is this game ever going to get finished to be like hey, this game is almost done how did that how did that happen <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's a that's a magical, magical moment and especially yeah. when working with other people like you in particular eric um and and i guess well I was going to say you in particular, but really everybody who worked on this, like the audio as well, uh, and and music from um, uh, Kevin and the rest of Power of Audio and Terrence Lee and Janice Kwan. Uh, anytime you would push something, and I pulled your work, it was like, wow, it's 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 seeing something with fresh eyes because it's you haven't seen you know the the work that you've done on say the frog cave or the atoll or something like that um and yeah that that moment of oh boy it's a real video game just kept happening over and over because of that awesome um kind of related to that is um a question again from our youtube um and this was from helgi um they were curious if you had any mentors during tunic's development uh yeah, um, uh, Adam Saltzman and um, Becca Saltzman from Vinci were instrumental in getting this thing off the ground from a design wise, from a design perspective and from a business perspective. And also um, Felix Kramer, very early on, he was the person who was like, this thing could go somewhere. I'm going to make sure that it gets put in front of the right people at the right time. Uh, and I, I value the contributions of all those people uh, a great deal. Awesome. I already got that. <laughs> um, recursive collapse from the Finji Discord is asking, um, how did y'all manage to make so many amazing little visual effects for basically everything in the game? It feels like everywhere you look, every little thing has some unique effect or shader never seen elsewhere, from the purple cavities to the tiny magic drops to the unique lighting in various areas. <laughs> Like the fish, I don't know if you can see on the stream here, but here are the here are Eric's fish, um, <laughs> which are lovely. Yeah. And like, I don't want to say uh, they're not they're not over engineered, but they are surprised that the the effect that they provide is because so much care was put into them. Like they are they have a flocking behavior, like they don't get too close to one another, and they avoid colliders such as you or or um, like the the coastline and stuff. Um, Really, really lovely. And I don't know, Eric, you, you, you might be able to speak specifically about stuff like the, uh, um, the fish, but I, little visual effects are my absolute favorite thing to do. Like, you know, yeah. candle flames or, you know, <laughs> holes in space and time or, uh, you know, a magical tuning fork ringing. I could spend the rest of my life doing little things like that. And it's, it, it feels fun to make those. Yeah, that's, that's also one of my favorite things yeah. you know, to work on. So I think just spending a lot of time on the areas. Um, the other thing is like, it might feel like every little area is different, but there is stuff that's reused. It's just that um, if you're really intentional about like when you're approaching an area, be like, these are the things that are going to distinguish this, um, whether that's the colors or the let's add petals floating down or that kind of thing. And just like focus on those things that, that the player will notice and will we'll make each area unique. Um, I think you get a lot of, of uh, bang for your buck that way as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just being intentional about that. Yeah. I'm just watching Andrew get chased by everything in this level. <laughs> that's the way you do it. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a pro stress right there. Don't play the video game, just run past everything. <laughs> Uh, fishing update when <laughs> that's a joke, <laughs> fully <Yes>. a joke. <laughs> feel like I need to be serious, uh, clear about that. <laughs> um, Charlie also from the discord, um, is curious about how you all worked with life formed and Janice Kwan, um, big claps there. Um, did you guys, uh, go back and forth with ideas and songs or were the soundtrack and game worked on in isolation? Um, and they said, I'm asking because Tunic has possibly the most natural soundtrack I've ever heard. Um, and it continues to be very complimentary about the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I can I can gush about the soundtrack too, because it's <laughs> uh, it's a it's a monumental feat that that Janice and Terrence pulled off. Um, it's enormous, first of all, and that vinyl is coming. 
I have a bunch of Slack messages from the people making the vinyl that I need to look at and do some spell checking and stuff that just came in this morning. I'm super excited about it. Um, I, I got a record player in anticipation of, of that soundtrack. Um, yeah, it was so early on, I approached Terrence saying, hey, I really like your the album that you did for the Double Fine documentary. Um, would you like to work together? And he said, yes, absolutely. And then there wasn't really much to do because I was busy like making the game and he did some experimentation and stuff. Um, and then as we got closer and closer to release, you know, year by year, it was like more and more back and forth. And, and most of that was with uh, Kevin Regami, the audio director from Power Up Audio, who would, um, I mean, I don't know really anything about music and they all do. So they were able to talk in, in a language that I don't really know. Um, but what I was able to provide was stuff like, here's the vibe and here's the message that you might want to encode in secret arpeggio language, um, which is something that, that Kevin came up with. Um, and yeah, so he, it would be like you would come up with that and then Kevin would be like, hey, here's the melody. You can put this in and then Terrence would put it in. So there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of back and forth there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and sometimes I would say things like, here's the music I've been listening to while working on this boss fight. And we don't, I don't want anything with this instrumentation. I don't want anything with this like melody or, or key or anything really. It's just, here's what my headspace was um, as far as like intensity goes and like, you know, emotion and stuff like that. And that was basically it. And then uh, Terrence and Janice with direction from, from Kevin would go off and just like create incredible works. Amazing. Uh, it's, <laughs> it, ha uh, it made it to my Spotify wrap up uh, last year, which I feel like, you know, is a point of pride. So <laughs> um, I know I'm not alone in that. I know the community has posted a lot about that. Um, how clear, oh, this is from Potatonator, which I think is probably a, a, one of the best usernames I've, I've got on this list um, from YouTube. How clear of an idea do you have about the lore you created for this world? And at what point did you start coming up with it? Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not engage the big mob of enemies while I think about this question. <laughs> uh, the, 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 I guess you could call it lore of the game existed for a long time as tone. Uh, as 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 vibes, um, and I think partly that's because any sort of concreteness that I applied to it made it seem smaller. And in a certain way, this was a problem that I was struggling with throughout a lot of development, which was this game doesn't feel like it has secrets in it because I. I knew all of them, right? This game doesn't feel like it's mysterious because everything is obvious. Um, and that's because when it comes down to actually implementing something, you need to answer every single one of those questions. And it is inherently going to be for the team that made it less mysterious, less exciting. And so story-wise, anytime I thought to myself, what's actually going on here? Let's bullet point it out. It was like, this is trite and small and not nearly as grand as I feel like it, it, it is in my head. And so that's why everything isn't left intentionally vague. Um, and I've seen people take all those little bits and pieces and assemble them. Um, yes, I've, I've watched a lore video <laughs> about my video game. I'm not embarrassed to say it was, it was delightful, but it's um, to to see them take those bits and pieces and sort of like put them together in something that like seems internally consistent and makes sense and is like more or less sort of what we were going for is cool that we can, um, you know, sketch something and provide a few details here and there that are meant to like allude to something larger and then have people take that and be like, I see this larger thing. And because it was left vague, I think it is, it, it, it can breathe a little bit more, if that makes sense, as opposed to like, here's the bullet point order of operations that happened in the background story. So it started out very vague. And as things got closer and closer to release and like cutscenes needed to be made and story progression needed to be implemented, um, it, it inherently got a little bit more concrete. 
but the the hope was the whole time that things left some imagination or some space for the imagination of the player. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I love, I love that. I'm not surprised, but I love that you also watch the lore videos. They're so great. They're so great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one that, that, uh, I think they reached out to me. I forget her name who did it, but reached out to me and was like, I'm going to make this video just so you know. I, I'm a communist and I'm going to put in some like, or like socialist or something and put some like stuff in there. And I'm like that A plus that, yes, this makes a lot of sense. Actually, now that I think about it, um, all this is internally consistent and works well with a reading that way. Amazing. <laughs> I love that little nugget. Um, Ixie it from our discord wants to know, um, what was the inspiration slash thought process that led to the creation of the Holy Cross? I've never seen a game change itself entirely from one, one mechanic, let alone as creatively one as creatively used in its puzzle as this. Um, picking up the page containing the Holy Cross is a moment in gaming I will never forget, and it made Tunic something special. Uh, that's great. Um, that's that was the the intended uh, um, emotional target. Was was someone picking it up and having that feeling of like, oh my god, this changes everything. I took I took the the metaphorical view of this game and rotated it and saw that there was another dimension to it. So yay, I'm glad it worked for you. Um, th that was the, so from the very start that idea of what if there was a game that looked like a point until you realized it was a line, looked like a line until you realized it was a square, looked like a square until you realized it was a cube. Um, that that idea um, was was there from the very start. Um, uh, Silver Star, the hexagon is a cube. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> a cube, uh, a hexagon is just a, a, a cube that uh, you're looking at it a certain way. Um, the uh, So having a few of those revelatory moments was, you know, like, oh, there's this input that you didn't know you could do. Cool. Oh, there's this series of inputs, this other thing that makes, that, that is, uh, that, that makes you realize there's more to the game. Oh, this thing that I've seen reference to, this Holy Cross, has been literally in my hands the whole time. Like those, <laughs> those sorts of things were uh, carefully thought about for a while. But it was, I feel like, yeah, it was. I should try and dig up the exact like note page where I started writing down that sort of stuff. But it was not early. Like the idea that something like that should happen. Um, was there from the very start, but I think specifically like Holy Cross stuff was like, you know, a mere four years in development or something like that. Uh, and uh, I guess, yeah, it's about, about halfway through something like that, give or take a year that it was like, oh, this, this is, this is an appropriate revelation for the end game. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm really glad that that landed well with people because when you told me about it, it was the thing I was the most nervous about because I was like, are people going to want to play this totally different game? I, <laughs> I'm happy it worked out. Uh, yeah. And, and it is like one of the, I feel like the defining, like when you look back at your playthrough, um, those are one of the moments that really stick out. And that's really interesting to hear, uh, Eric, that you were nervous about it. <laughs> Yeah, it, was, um, it was risky for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another, um, this one from Twitter, Silvered Outcome um, asks on Twitter X, uh, <laughs> one of the most mind boggling puzzles in the game is, in my opinion, the secret save file. Where did this idea come from? Is it a reference to something? Uh, it is a reference to renting games as a kid and finding the like, I don't think it was a rent. I think I borrowed it from a friend or something like that. It was a copy of Zelda 2 for the NES. And there was a, a save file that was just like 888. And it was like max stats across the board. And uh, it was this like strange, mysterious, holy thing. Like you didn't want to go in there because like you don't want to see the ending before you're supposed to. But the fact that like someone was here before and they found a bunch of secrets was uh, was a cool thing. And I think it was at... 2016, so pretty shortly in, into development that I thought, I uh, was thinking like, oh, th this moment of finding the old save file seems like it would be a really cool thing. And then that idea would just sort of like stay like at the back of my mind for a long, long time uh, until I was working on the like the Holy Cross stuff in the manual. It's like, well, this would be 
This would be a really cruel way to hide a secret is to have it be a secret save file that shows up at a certain point. Um, but yeah, the genesis of it was the the feeling of renting a game or taking a game home and, and realizing that there's this, 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 I don't know, again, it's, it's the feeling of like, this wasn't made for you. This was made for the big kids who have already played and finished <laughs> this game and have all the stats and I've got evidence of it right there. This thing that I'm excited about, but terrified of, and I go in and I don't know what's going on. I think that happened with Final Fantasy as well. Like the first time I got a Final Fantasy cartridge, which only has one save file on it on the, on the NES and putting it in being like, continue game. And all the characters are like these buff super wizards and, and knights and stuff like that. Uh, and being just like absolutely baffled at what's going on. Uh, and then, yeah, realizing you're just, you're just little, you could never be that cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, that's the, the, the hallowed artifact of the, the, the yeah. big kid save file. Yeah. Rad Ringtail says, I legit thought it was a day one bug. I remember we got a bunch <laughs> of reports about that <laughs> yeah. after the launch. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to only get to play games after my brother, my older brother played them. So that's really familiar to me. Like, I, I feel like I, I always had a secret save file. <laughs> <laughs> um, Atlas from the Finji Discord uh, really wants to know whether Tunic Fox has a favorite type of cheese. Hard hitting questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of what, what, defines the personality of Tunic Fox. They uh, get up to mischief and love treasure a lot. So maybe the little cheeses that come in their own little wax covering or like the ones <laughs> that come in wedges. Oh yeah, yeah, triangles. Uh, Tunic Fox <laughs> loves triangles. So it's those little wedges. Oh, yeah. And it's like a little, it's like a little prize that you could open up. And then you can save the wax and make like a big wax ball out of it or something. Yes, that's right. right. <laughs> the best part of that cheese <laughs> do you have an opinion eric uh i was gonna say uh jalapeno havarti but mm. i had no basis for saying that i think that's just my <laughs> oh, the, uh, the it's got the i don't have any right now but the peppers the peppers would be good also um it looks you know smooth and delicious but it, it has some bite to it i think that's yeah, a yeah. maybe tunic specific thing i love that <laughs> amazing um Many fans are curious about whether any community creations have pleasantly surprised you in the past two years. Uh, the fan art is amazing. There, are, I, I don't want to call out any particular artists specifically, but the I I don't know how. Sorry, I'm, it's a tense moment here, a tense gaming moment. <laughs> um, the the feeling of doing art that you think is like barely good enough. And then having someone else take that and do something beautiful with it is a rare and wonderful pleasure. So like, um, I don't know, I still look at like the fox and illustrations of the fox as like, dirt, 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 except for the ones that Mako did, which are beautiful and wonderful. Um, and so every time I saw one of those, when this is the, the illustrator that did a lot of the, I'll see if I can pull some up in the game here. Um, uh, like these illustrations, these are good, and therefore by Mako. Um, uh, <laughs> this one is chunky and bad, and therefore done by me. Um, same, same with this one. That one's it's by, cute. By me. It's cute. It's cute. It's yeah. It's exactly. It was the, the the. I mean, I think this was a thing in the NES, like Zelda manuals, where like Miyamoto or something would be like, dur, 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 I can draw these like chunky little wide links and that's great. And then you have these lavish illustrations that are done by someone else. And that was the sort of thing that we wanted. Like all of this is, is Mako because this is like good and has nice line weight and stuff. Um, uh, and then you've got, bam, just is my doodle. Um, and... That one's a favorite. <laughs> Don't be rude to it. <laughs> I, 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 I love all my doodles equally. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, I lost the train of thought. Oh yeah, so right. Um, so seeing someone take your like design, I guess, and, and create something beautiful is always nice. And so seeing fan art from people, whether it's a 3D model that they made or an illustration or a felted figurine or anything like that is just like, hey, that's, that's I know, I know that guy. Uh, I know that general Yeah, guy. just, just uh, the variety and like the quality. Uh, there's so much art coming out from people and it's been really cool to see. 
Um, I kind of wanted to shout out the tunic randomizer. I haven't actually tried it, but it's, yes. I, I love that there is a randomizer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's, um, I was going to mention that at some point as well. Um, so there's a few people, some, um, I see um, uh, Skippy, Scipio White, right in chat is working on it. And Sil oh yeah, Silence there, uh, Silent Destroyer, SR there in chat have, and, and a number of others um, have worked on um, tunic randomizer, which, um, cannot be officially endorsed on this official Finchy stream, but you should totally <laughs> check it out. Um, I'm telling you as a friend, um, because it's it's utterly amazing. And I think sometime last year, I got a chance to do a playthrough on a, on a stream um, with the creators of the randomizer as well as, as Rad Ringtail. And um, what a delight, because it takes the game and uh, if you're not familiar with what a randomizer is, it's uh, a nefarious hacker has gone in <laughs> and given you an illegal download that you should not take, and it patches the game to uh, add a whole bunch of extra functionality, like uh, taking every chest in the game and swapping all of the contents around. Or um, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. The, 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 the stuff that they've done with the, the Tunic randomizer is truly incredible. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's yeah um yeah yeah uh, just ruining dicey's version of where an item should be well that that's the that's what's wonderful about it is that you could think i know exactly where i'm supposed to go there are no surprises in this game and then suddenly realize oh no the stick isn't there now i need a, a quest to go and find a stick but they've done some really neat things where uh there's not a stick and a sword there's a bunch of uh weapon upgrades that increase the capacity of your ability to upgrade damage. And I won't spoil it, but like there's more than just a stick and a sword in the tunic randomizer, as well as myriad other things. Like they're doing things now where like all the ladders are gone and you need to <laughs> unlock the lad ladders or something. It's ridiculous. Anyway, yeah, absolutely do not check it out. Um, <laughs> I don't know if the wink came across on the screen. I um, should have had a zoom ready for that. <laughs> yeah, there's also the um, the speedrun community in general. I think it's uh, rad. Help me. Is it tunic dot run or something like that? Uh, we can pop that in the chat. It's tunic dot. Can I? I got it. I got it. Sorry, loud keyboard. Tunic dot. Run. <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah, I a think worthy that's it. sacrifice. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Emily's got um, it. <laughs> thanks, Emily. Um, it, there's like exhaustive guides on how to do all the stuff. Um, if you want to start with like gun percent, which is uh, getting the gun as early as possible, uh, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, just a lot of fun stuff. Really great community as well. Um, although it's a really good, good name for that category. Uh, yeah, gun, gun percent. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I feel um, my I just my my heart swells when I think about people um, putting their their effort and their their joy into something like this. It's um it's really wonderful. So thank you, um, speedrun team and randomizer team making making cool, cool stuff. Absolutely. Um here, here. <laughs> um I think our last question um that we've got prepared um before we maybe ask uh, answer a couple, just a couple from the the chat today. Um Lots and lots of fans want to know what is next for you both um, and how they can best support you in whatever that is, which I think is incredibly wholesome. So <laughs> what's going on and how can we support you? Uh, well, I know that there's this cool game called Praxis Fighter X. Is that right? Uh, yeah. That's... Do you want to talk about Praxis Fighter X? Sure. Yeah. So, so since Tunic came out, I've been working on some smaller Pico Eight games. Pico Eight is a little fantasy console. If you don't know, that has kind of retro pixel art stuff. So, I just put out I just put out a shoot 'em up game called Praxis Fighter X, um, where you play as a protester who steals a prototype plane and is attacking a pipeline. Um, and uh, a, couple, a year and a half ago, I also released a roguelike called Into Ruins. So that's mostly what I've been doing. Um, I am eventually going to release my puzzle game, Spring Falls, on Android, which I, because uh, Google keeps threatening to close my developer account due to inactivity. <laughs> so I'm going to do it. Um, and yeah, just, I'm, I'm, I'm always working on a couple things at once. Uh, that, that's it for me for now. What about you, Andrew? What have you been working on? Um, nothing like 
commercially viable or released or anything like that. I've been noodling around with um, other game engines, like trying to get back to like programming roots. Um, and uh, I've been using Monogame and like trying to make an entity component system in Monogame, which has been really fun and satisfying. And I'm using that for some stuff now, experimenting a little bit with like multiplayer. I think the the thing that I'm allowing myself to do is uh, making being okay making something that isn't a puzzle game uh, that or like a, a game that is full of secrets that expands and stuff. Like I, I hope this is my, my 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 hope that at some point I'm going to be able to feel comfortable releasing something that isn't that kind of game and having people be okay with it. You know, it's I feel like new game from one of the people behind Tunic. It's not a puzzle game at all. It's it's this thing that is not a sequel in any way. It's a small little weird project, um, and yeah, I, I I hope that that is okay. I ask this of you, chat, forgiveness for not making Tunic Two and instead doing what I think is fun. So um, yeah, yeah. My my mission seems to be make one game in every genre. So ah, oh, that's a great idea. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. So Zelda like puzzly game. Um, uh, uh, visual novel murder mystery, uh, maybe be a good one. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric's on a mission. That's right. Eric's gonna make a game in every genre. I did. I, I made a fighting game once. A really bad, like, uh, like, it was designed as part of a like roulette thing where a bunch of people would go head to head. Is that Fantastic Arcade or something? People would go head to head okay. and they would spin a big wheel and it would pick a random game from once the people had submitted. So it was only meant to be paid, played for like 30 seconds. Uh, but I made a fighting game once. That's cool. I tried to make a fighting game in uh, the Games Factory back in however long ago that was. It was not good. <laughs> They're hard. <laughs> yeah, fighting games are hard to make. Uh, tunic, but it's a beat-em-up. That's right. Belt scroller, tunic. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Dicey's Boomer Shooter. Maybe not, but <laughs> good idea. I like that. <laughs> You've been forgiven. Yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Officially Thanks, forgave Chad. you. <laughs> yeah. Officially, preemptively forgave you. Um, so that's the end of the questions that I've pulled from many, many different places um, for today. Um, we have a couple of minutes. Um, we can answer just a few from the chat. Um, and what I think I'll do is have chat add a couple of questions. Um, and Eric and Andrew, just feel free to answer them without me butting in. I think that's probably the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. Uh, how and when did Finji get involved with Tunic, um, says uh, Seraph. Um I, I think it was 20, it must have been 20, late 2016, maybe 2017, something like that. Like the thing is that they, like uh, Becca and Adam were involved from very early on as mentors. Um, and like I was talking to them being like, hey, I'm working on this thing. What do you think? Um, they helped when I was like getting funding early on. Um, I was saying like, How, what's a good way to, you know, Right, a funding pitch or whatever, and they were able to help there. So they were helping out for a long time. And then when it became clear that the game needed a publisher, uh, they, they were a natural choice to go with. And they've been they've been fabulous. Um, what else we got there? Uh, specific influence of Zelda 2, uh, that twangy soundtrack. Mm, oh, so good. Um, <laughs> Zelda 2, like the fact that you could upgrade, like that's not normally a thing in Zelda games, but Zelda 2 has like an upgrade mechanic, which I think is cool. And so the idea of like, aha, you thought it was this game, but actually it's a little bit like Zelda 2, everybody's favorite Zelda game. Um, uh, I don't know, you can butt in also, Eric, if you see anything there. Uh, yeah, someone asked when the manual, I think, or the pages were added. Which I think we sort of talked about earlier, but yeah, I do remember sort of the the location of some of the pages getting shuffled around pretty late because we're like, we definitely want them to find this page. Yeah, and yeah, like exactly. Half of people are missing it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's shuffling things so it's a little bit closer to a position, like physically in the world, or moving information from one page to another, or moving one page to an entirely different part of the manual, which is really hard because if you move a page, you're actually changing like four pages. Because you've got spreads on either side and then you're yeah. moving it to a new place and those spreads change and yeah um 
someone asking how I joined and whether we knew each other. Um, we, we did know each other. I think we met at GDC and then like the next GDC we did at Train Jam. We, were, we worked on uh, Mr. Mayor on, on Train Jam. Yeah. Which was, <laughs> I, I did the, the music for that. The sweet bossa nova beats. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was it. Did you, did you, you came to Halifax to one of the game collective things, what, right? You like came to my house once for. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was in, I was yeah. in town uh, just yeah, traveling. That was cool. Oh, wait, my camera's gone blurry. How does that happen? Oh, Ooh. there you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, what was the hardest part of development for the game? Were there any parts that almost make you want to quit? Asks PJB Gamer. Um, yeah, there were lots of like staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night thinking, what a terrible mess that I've made. How can I get out of this? Um, so yeah, there, there were, I think the, the hardest part was the scope. Um, it's like suddenly realizing that's like, this thing is so big, like getting to a point where it's like, I've been working on this game for three years and it feels like 10% of it is done. At this rate, I will be dead before the game is done. So that, that sort of like crushing pressure was, was definitely hard for sure. Um, Let's see. Um, uh, oh, thank you, uh, Emily, for linking to Mr. Mayor. For, full title is, so you can get this right, it's Mr. Mayor tells your fortune, recounts a story and offers you snacks, something like that, that uh, made with uh, Eric and I and Josie Bruckner did sound effects, I think, and Kate Gray did the, uh, the, the words. Um, Zeldronic, thoughts on future indie games taking inspiration from Tunic? That would be amazing. Anybody cites Tunic as an inspiration for them, I would. Yeah, I would love that. that. Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. That good, good feels, you know? <laughs> uh, Haunted by the specter of Mr. Pringles' cousin. Never heard of Pringles. Don't know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, 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 that's where the trophy's from. The one early on, I, I walked past it when I was playing the game. I should have gotten it, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's an illusion. A lot of the illusions are, or the, the trophies are illusions to uh, other games that were worked on. Like there's one that's specifically the the flower from Spring Falls. That's Eric's game. Yeah. Uh, there's Mr. Bear. There's um, uh, Kevin Kevin Studios logo. Um, what else we got? There's I don't know. It might be clipped. Oh no, it's it's right above my head. This here is a a Commodore 1701 uh, monitor, which is what the uh, one of them is styled after. Um, oh, Animal Well is supposed to be Tunic, if not, if not mistaken. Didn't the dev specifically mention Tunic? I, I have spoken with that person, Billy, Billy maybe, and I might be getting that wrong. I'm sorry, not Billy, if that's not your name. Um, uh, it's a... Uh, question asked by Morpheus Luna, um, Lune. Uh, yeah, Animal Well looks amazing. I saw that and was immediately struck and was like, I, I got to play this game. And then I talked to the person and they knew who I was and stuff. So that was, that was super cool. But yeah, I'm excited about that. Uh, Mr. Mayor is my son boy, says Kate Gray. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Kate Gray, everybody, welcome to the chat, uh, creator of Mr. Mayor. Uh, <laughs> Does garden uh, night like gardening? Uh, oh, that's what I want to see. I want to see the, uh, the the garden night, just like with one of those foam pads, so it can kneel down, um, and it's just like planting some tulips. That sounds great. Oh yeah, speaking of garden night, that that's one thing that I wanted to add, and never and never there wasn't time to do it, but I wanted there to be a single bird on the garden night. And when the garden night activated, I wanted the bird to fly away. And I never, I never got to do that. Oh, that'd be great. I love that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Richter the Ferret, which Zelda game is your favorite, regardless of how influential it was to Tunic? Um, I feel like Zelda 1 is the one that is like, ah, oh, most nostalgic to my soul and like, is the most like clearest line of inspiration but then breath of the wild came out and it just it it filled me with such joy um just the like what what is that no what's that 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 was just a tremendous um you know whatever it was summer when i played that uh what's mr mayor's first name mr i think i don't know you tell me kate <laughs> uh is the bird from manual from the minute 
is that the bird from the Nano Coup? Oh yeah, the one that, the, the one that uh, takes flight and oh, yeah, goes off. Um, yeah, it wasn't there because it was busy being in the manual. That's a little drawing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, uh, yeah. Um, single bird flies away DLC when for nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, you too can watch the bird fly away. No, don't do that. <laughs> uh, Rat says Breath of the Wild is just. Uh, 3D Zelda 1, so fair. Yeah, totally. Um, Cassidy Books, question for Andrew Schultz. What is the thing about Tunic that is most nostalgic for me? Uh, for me, that became the implementation of the manual. Right, right. Um, oh, that's a tricky one because it's none of it is like it's, the nostalgia for me is going to be different than the one that is experienced by the player, I think. Like, nostalgia for me is probably looking at Dorito Fox and thinking about like, the first summer working on the game being full of like excitement and fervor and like slowly feeling the encroaching dread of the magnitude of the odyssey of which upon which I had embarked started to come in. Um, yeah, so that's, I have a lot of complicated memories about the development of the game. Yeah. Uh, but, oh, a uh, good, good, uh, good answer for it. That was the, the music because that, that taps directly emotionally into me and it isn't something I worked on. So, um, Eric, I'm sorry, but you did a cover of the uh, uh, of the I guess like the main theme, like the overall track that yeah. was uh, beautiful, just absolutely wonderful. Thank and you. that was a thing that I think is like, yeah, I think that like triggered within me. I think the nostalgia that I, I, I am supposed to feel is listening to that, and just being like absolutely crushed in a good way. Um, it's was, uh, it was very good. Oh, I got to get my hands um, on that. I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. it's, it's lovely. Uh, Ryan asks, have I ever actually played Metro 2? Yes. Um, it's like pretty good. It's it's a weird game and is kind of cool. I don't think I've ever actually finished it, but it's... Yeah, it's, I, I, I played it too, but I didn't get very far. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Emily linking to Eric's cover of Memories of Memories. It's, uh, it's real good. Oh, thank you, Emily. <laughs> Saving that. Uh, conversion methods. Are you able to say whether or not there's another dimension to the game? Asks Ori. Ah, uh, yes. The, the, this point that has slowly become a cube. Is it actually secretly a hypercube? Um, I mentioned this early on that it's like if if there if there was a hypercube there, if there wasn't a hypercube, would you want to know? Like, wouldn't you rather be like, oh man, maybe there was a hypercube? I'll never know. What a beautiful thing to hold in my heart. Um, the uh, O Aogazd asks the manual being a foreign language thing was just a big nostalgia hit. As a European, I remember not being able to understand uh, a lot of in game tutorials. Uh, myself. Yeah, that's um, I've heard that from a few people, like someone who. Um, it, does not necessarily have English as their first language experienced this as a as a, a, a memory of the past where you get, you know, like import games or something like that, where um, even the manual, something that was supposed to tell you how to play, was itself sort of a mystery. Um, so <laughs> yeah, for sure. Sort of a serendipitous sort of uh, way of approaching that same sort of thing. Uh, Misk Bai asks, what are your favorite game OSTs? I would like to mention the Hyper Light Drifter soundtrack by Disaster Piece. It's one of my favorite. Yeah. yeah so good. That, that sound is um, really great. When I, when I started learning the, the piano a few years ago, the uh, the panacea from that game was one of the first things I learned. And it's, it's very, very nice. Yeah. The the, the texture of um, Rich's work, Disaster Piece, is, is like, it's, it's this like very delicious bit crunch that I just so characteristic of, of yeah. the game that I, I really love. Um, I listen to the, the Bloodborne soundtrack a lot. Um, <laughs> there, There's a fan album, actually, of Majora's Mask. There's two. The, the same person made two versions of it. Let's see if I can find it. Um, it's, uh, what is it called? It's like... I'm trying to remember, maybe somebody could find it before me, but uh, uh, Dress Mask Fan Album. I'm trying to remember what it is. Time's End. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that is really incredible. It's, yeah. I got a terriblefate.com. Um, I don't know if I'm an admin in this chat. This might not work. No, there we go. Um, it's, uh, 
it's a couple of albums that just take the soundtrack of um, Majora's Mask and blow it up into this this mesmerizing like emotional roller coaster. It's it's really tremendous. <laughs> if you could pick one single non-computer object food that you could make without tunic, what would it be? Um, I, hmm, I don't know. Just looking around my desk. Uh, does caffeine count as food? I don't know. Oh, um, a, uh, a work timer. Uh, that's the thing on my desk. Um, press a button and it counts up. Uh, the number of minutes that you've worked, and it beeps every once in a while to remind you to stamp and, uh, and stretch. I probably um, wouldn't have been able to finish the game without that. Uh, I'm going to pick my bicycle. Yeah, good one. I'm going to need one of those, Andrew. <laughs> I'm going to uh, send me the link to that. <laughs> uh, I, I made it myself, actually. I, uh, you can tell. It's, 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 I can't, I can't ever take it on an airplane because it looks terrifying. Oh, my um, gosh. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> That's uh, even better. Well, I used to use a um, like a, a, a tomato timer, like a Pomodoro technique, like you would actually use an egg timer, like one of those tomato shaped ones that you put, um, like normally in your kitchen, people would use those to do 25 minute times. But I don't know, certain activities like programming require you work for longer stretches. So what I really wanted was just something that told me how long I had been working and occasionally yeah. was like, hey, don't turn into a tree, like have and stretch a little bit um, so I could log where I put time. Uh, can you talk about the CRT filter behind the manual screen? Uh, does it have gameplay or lore implications? Uh, it, it is meant to evoke that feeling that you would have, like, oh, let me look down for my screen and like flip through this manual. And, and the manual itself is like it's sort of ambiguous where it fits within the world, like you're finding them within the game, but they're glowing and sort of mysterious, and you pick them up, and now suddenly you're outside. So it's meant to, you know, violate some what are normally pretty strict lines of of like causality and 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 um like it's you know the, the metal layering sort of thing um so the the lore i guess is that you are playing the video game you player are playing the video game and when you take a pause to look at the manual that's you looking at the manual it's a bad answer but you, you get the idea <laughs> um uh, feel like sharing how many of your team are neurodivergent i feel like a lot of programmers end up being on autism or adhd spectrum myself included um i don't know um i don't i don't know i, I feel like uh, neurotypical is a strange word because it implies that there is a typical brain um i don't know much about the uh the the exact science behind all that sort of thing but i i don't i i have not diagnosed or self-diagnosed myself with anything in particular um but I also don't know. Maybe my brain does work different than everyone else's. I don't know. Uh, uh, how much real life history inspired you in Tunic's lore? We see a lot of allegory between ancient Babylonian times, like with Tunic's rooted ziggurat, in Greek and medieval times of the cathedral. I, I should be reading these more. I shouldn't just be scanning through them. Or in Greek to medieval times with the cathedral and the arrows laurels. Um, I, I wish I had a really uh, um, erudite answer for this, but I don't. <laughs> I don't know much about history at all. Uh, some of the imagery is just pulled because that looks cool, and it sort of speaks to this the, yeah. the the really particular melange of like you know ancient histories that are often smashed together for video games. Um, but uh, uh, points <laughs> amazing erudite, yeah, <laughs> saved. <laughs> Um, are the tuning forks tuning forking? I don't understand. I think it's nonsense. Okay. And then, yes. So, more, more nonsense. So it's tuning forks. Okay. Uh, I like all these different historical influences. It gives the game a sort of out of time place, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. That's, yeah. yeah. I think that's a, probably a safer bet to, to sort of acknowledge it being a sort of like vague melange as opposed to making specific references to real world events. Yeah, and, and being inspired by other media that was probably itself inspired by historical things. Hmm, yeah. yeah, it's all shaking through the sieve. Uh, Emily asks Eric, 
which part of your contributions are you most proud of? Oh, uh, I don't know. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. Um, Halftone shader, fish. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I, I just. Uh, I think, just the the general feeling I, I was able to get for each of the areas and how they're distinct from each other. I think that was. If, if there's a specific thing, probably the fish or maybe the waterfalls that I, I played around with and hmm. um, maybe transported some of my knowledge from Spring Falls in, into into the water in this game. Oh, yeah. Some <laughs> sick waterfall tech. Waterfall <laughs> wisdom brought in. Um, uh, Mij Dev asks, any animation wisdom uh, for Tunic development? It feels like it hasn't been touched on much. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel... Uh, like I have a handful of animation tricks that I keep reusing. And I, I did a video a while ago on some of them, like um, uh, squash and stretch and secondary motion and stuff like that. I think secondary motion was the one that I feel like added the most sort of bounce to the world. And um, when I did animation in Blender, there was this really specific technique of like skewing the keyframes. So you would animate something sort of like naively you know, like you would animate all the parts moving like pretty rigidly. And then you would take all of the uh, auxiliary elements like the ears or the puff of um, fur on the top of the fox's head or, um, you know, like uh, stuff like that and make sure that the, all those keyframes came slightly after. And so they lagged a little bit. And so you had this sort of like wibbly motion like that as opposed to being more rigid. Um, and uh, doing reference, I feel like. I like looking at videos of either myself trying to take actions or um, uh, animations, like whether it's from games or real life or whatever that I found inspiring, like really, really looking carefully frame by frame at how they evoked a certain feeling. So like the um, that big skeleton guy that nobody likes, there's like two of them in the game. Um, that has the big hammer made of skulls. Like I spent a lot of time looking at the the Kirk hammer, like R2 from Bloodborne, um, which has this really good like setting the knees down and like you can see where the energy is coming from. Like the, the player character in that case is like pushing up, like they're putting all their effort, <laughs> not into like swinging this thing, but just like pushing up and trying to heave the center of mass over their shoulder and having it be this like, and like really looking at where the energy is coming from, like the literal like mechanical force and how it's being applied in some of those animations um, was really useful for figuring out like how do I communicate, you know, weight or speed or whatever. Yeah. Uh, why hexagons? Uh, the <laughs> coolest yeah. shape. Yeah, I somehow ended up working on three games back to back that all heavily featured hexagons. Um, oh yeah, so Spring Falls, hexagons, tunic, hexagons, and um, the roguelike, right? Yeah, it's got X grid. Yeah. yeah, hexagons are just nice. Hexagons are bestagons, says someone with a very blue username. <laughs> the peace triple, yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, and as Ori points out, hexagons are flattened cubes in an isometric perspective. Yeah, yeah so cubes also very cool. Um, and yeah, there was some like the glyph language. They're all hexagons as well. And that was like the 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 like late 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 in the game. You see that they're you can construct them out of three D shapes, um, and that like that's how they were originally built. Actually, like the the, the rendering out of those um, component pieces was done by building a cube. Or like an elongated prism, I guess, and, and turning the edges on or off. Uh, what is the least <laughs> cool shape? Hmm. Some a, a a shape with negative six sides, obviously. How <laughs> uh, was working with Microsoft and launching on Game Pass Day One? Would you do it again? It was fabulous. It was. Um, I mean to be like, I think Game Pass in particular is neat because for, for, for Tunic especially, uh, the the thought of a game being, like I mentioned going to a rental store, uh, like a Blockbuster, I don't know if y'all know Blockbuster, uh, but like a video games rental store um, and just like looking 
at all these boxes and being like, what looks cool um, is an experience that we don't really have anymore because you would have to like, you know, pay money to actually buy the games. But if you've got Game Pass, then um, you could just peruse what's available and be like, I'll give this, like, I like foxes. There's this fox game. Let me give it a try. Um, and so from a like sort of um, touchy feely perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense for Tunic. And Microsoft was super supportive the whole way through, like getting uh, to showcase the game as part of the 2018 um, their E3 press conference was was huge. And so, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was good. A plus. Uh, Andrew's voice just doubled up even worse. That might be me um, starting to lose my voice very slightly. I don't know. <clears throat> Drink some water here. <laughs> we are uh, just about at two hours. So <laughs> this might actually be a good chance to wrap up unless there were any last questions that were uh, calling out to you. Um, I'll always take a question from Rad Ringtail. What is the cost benefit decision making process like for patching small bugs in a game the size of Tunic? Um, that is largely handled by Finchie's phenomenal QA team, who are um, true masters of their craft, and they're good at isolating a problem, like identifying and isolating a problem, um, and assessing whether or not it will impact people negatively. Yeah, um, prioritizing, it, categorizing yeah, things. Yeah. Um, so there are things like, this is a game-breaking bug where people's saves get accidentally deleted because Windows doesn't know how to handle files. Um, <laughs> we should fix that ASAP. That's a priority. And they'll tell us that. Um, and um, then there's you know other things like, <sighs> We got a bug report from someone saying they really want to put a bird that flies away from the tunic night. <laughs> Do we risk introducing a problem that breaks the game to add this? Like, maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, any books we recommend? Uh, I, I read The Road recently, which I do not recommend if you like Tunic and are like, oh boy, I like Sunshine. It is not a Sunshine-filled book, <laughs> um, but it was um, very cool. Um, yeah, I just finished reading uh, Always Coming Home by Ursula K. Le Guin, and mm -hmm. it was extremely good. Yeah. And it's, it, yeah. Got this whole like fictionalized future society um, and goes into, it, it's like written sort of like, it's like an anthropological book about this culture that doesn't actually exist. And it's it's really well done and good, yeah. What Great was that. the name of it again? Uh, Always Coming Home. Always Coming Home, cool. Um, if you uh, if you like Ursula K. Le Guin um, and you like fantasy stuff and you do want something that's a little bit more lighthearted, the Wizard of Earthsea series is, yeah. uh, is really Extremely great. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and don't stop two chapters into the second book because it gets better and cooler. Uh, it's it's super good fourth book super amazing um i yeah. did not uh, know you were a Le Guin fan we got to talk about that <laughs> oh boy uh, i actually i i should read more of her work i've read the the first four books of that series and left out of darkness i i'm still working on it's like in my backlog. <laughs> i think i've read pretty much all of her stuff except oh, really? for um except for the orsinia stuff but i do have that and i also have her translation of the Tao Te Ching, which I've read a little bits and pieces of. Yeah, she's That's brilliant. Cool. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move uh, us sorry. over to the screen. Oh, OK. Weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> I can stop doing interesting things on the video game. Um, I didn't think I could like Dicey more, but then he recommends her to say, yeah, let's see, let's get stuff. Literally uh, me right now. <laughs> yeah, there's a part of the book where there's just like an evil rock at the bottom of a tower that is so evil that he can't, oh, it's so good. It's just, <laughs> it's so, it's like uh, grand and like, uh, like you're being told a fairy tale in that sort of like ancient gravitas of it, but without feeling the sort of like saccharine sing-songiness that a lot of, Fairy tales are it's yeah mm, good 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 good. <laughs> uh, Earthsea's finale, a lot of love for Earthsea. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for you. all the amazing questions. It's been really yeah, this yeah, has been amazing. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> we got thank questions you. in advance. We got questions in the chat. Um, it's it's been fantastic. That's a good thing. And uh, yeah, thank you, Aster, for compiling all of them and hosting. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. fun. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we could we could talk forever, but I am starting to uh, lose my voice a little bit. But yeah, what I might do on this the the tongue anniversary um, is hang out in probably probably tunic spoilers on the Discord. It might be the best place to do it. Um, yeah, but uh, Discord.gg slash slash Finji. If people don't have it already, it's probably in the description under the the Twitch video. If people are on Twitch and aren't there. But uh, yeah, maybe I'll spend a little bit of time in there before uh, eating some ice cream cake. Uh, <laughs> if you look in general discussion or tunic general, there's a picture of an ice cream cake a little ways up there um, that I'm uh, my my partner got for us, and I'm gonna enjoy some of that. Just pop a lactate and go to town on some ice cream cake. <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> the cake looks fantastic. It looks yes. really good. <laughs> I've had an ice cream cake in so long. Um, but yeah, please, folks, feel free to join the Discord. Um, it is, uh, there's a lot of members, but it ends up, it it still manages to be a very cozy and welcoming and warm place. Um, so I think you'll really like it. Um, feel free to hang out. Uh, definitely go into the spoiler chat knowing that you're going to encounter spoilers. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank y'all so, so much for hanging out with us today. Um, thank you, Andrew thank you and Eric, well. for answering all of our amazing questions. Um, here's to three Nick next year. We'll be back. We'll be <laughs> yeah. talking about you know, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. more lessons on Greek words and <laughs> games we like and all that. Um, but yeah, thank y'all so so much for hanging out. Um, and um, you know, make sure to follow this channel if if you enjoyed. Um, we're we're planning to do things like this at least quarterly. Um, bringing on different uh fingy devs um and sometimes to do just some chill stuff as well so um follow us if you haven't um follow our socials um and yeah definitely get on pi buying that um vinyl because oh my gosh it looks so good <laughs> i can't yeah. wait for it <laughs> yeah, really excited <laughs> um any last words you two um i don't know go go Check out Practice Praxis Fighter X. Uh, I think also on Steam, Tunic is on sale right now. I mean, yeah. if you're watching this, if you've been watching this and you haven't played the game, shame <laughs> on you. Uh, but, but if for some reason you want to pick it up, you can on sale right now. Steam Spring Sale. <laughs> yeah, just, I don't have anything to add except thank you, everyone. Awesome. Yeah. Thank y'all. Uh, take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.